welcome to the Chorus in the Chaos. My name is Jack, and I'm with Grayson and Blake, and this is episode number two. In the first uh, podcast we did, first episode, we talked about what the church is, and we talked about what makes it up and, you know, all facets of that, and I encourage you to listen to that if you haven't, uh, if you're catching this in the second one. And this this episode, uh, having defined and talked a little bit about what it is, we're going to talk about what the church does, you know, what's distinct about the church, and, you know, what are the activities of the church you know, in the world today. So um, with that, you know, we've got a list here and I'll just up front, just going to run through it kind of like a table of contents for the podcast, if you will, because we're not hiding anything here, but, you know, in a summary, uh, we, we, you know, the group of us, we got together and we jotted down preaching and teaching ordinances and sacraments, scripture, reading, prayer, and praise. And um, we'll, we'll kind of walk through those. Some, some topics we may take, more or less time than others and some we may we may debate more or less than others um but uh at the end of the day should be should be good so just to kick things off then so preaching and teaching so what does the church do blake i think you had some just maybe get us going here some initial thoughts on you know what what that is and and why that's significant yeah Uh, as we were talking about these different things one of the Distinctives, I guess, that we used or one of the the marks that we used to decide what makes a church a church, of course, are the things that we find in Scripture. Uh, What separates a church meeting on the Lord's Day from a club meeting? Uh, So as we're looking at these things, these are things that are uniquely and distinctly Christian, and so when we look at the you know the the supremacy of the word, when we look at prayer, when we look at worship, I mean all of these different things, you may seem you may see you know forms and shadows of these things in other religions and and that sort of thing, but what we're talking about here are things that the Word of God has put out for us for a Christian church service, uh, and so again. This is what separates the church from a club meeting or the church from the Boy Scouts or the church from you walking around in the woods thinking that you're, you know, having church or whatever the case may be. Uh, And so the first thing is really uh, the preaching of God's word. And of course, in God's word, we see a primacy of God's word. Uh, In 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, uh, Timothy is being written to by Paul. And he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and at his, uh, by his appearing and his kingdom. In verse 2, he says, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And then it's really interesting in verse four, he says, and they will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And so right there, of course, Paul is linking that scripture itself, preaching the word, God's word is truth. And there's coming a season and a time where people will reject God's word, reject the truth. They will collect teachers that will tell them what they want to hear, and then they wander off into myths. And then he charges Timothy in verse 5, as for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, and do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Uh, In 2 Timothy 3, just before this, uh, 16 and 17, he says something similar when he's talking about the power of God's word. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So we need God's word to equip us, and for the preacher, God's word is our equipment. And so it's kind of a two-prong thing there. Uh, The command to preach the word itself is significant. Uh, We're not commanded to give our opinions. Uh, Your pastor is not commanded to give uh, a little talk or his thoughts, or just a collection of musing anecdotes and moralism, uh, your pastor is called to actually preach the word. It has forcefulness behind it. Uh, He is to proclaim it boldly, loudly, rightly. And there needs to be a sense of urgency uh, as well. I think uh, whether you are Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever flavor of uh, believer you are, 
I think we all agree that the world in the state that it is right now, there is an urgency for God's word uh, to be preached and to be preached rightly. Uh, he, uh, Paul urges Timothy to do the the exact opposite of what the watchmen are doing in Isaiah fifty six. 10. So you would think about a watchman. Uh, They're supposed to be alert. Uh, They're supposed to be sober-minded. They're supposed to be warning the people when there is danger. And what does God say about the watchman in Isaiah 56, 10? It says, his watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, and loving to slumber. Uh, It is a sad state when a church moves away from God's word or a collection of people move away from God's word uh, and preachers become concerned with anything but what God has to say uh, to the to the local body. And when that happens, when you remove God's word from the setting, uh, you become like those watchmen, dumb dogs that cannot bark, ignorant, lying down, loving to slumber, uh, the exact opposite of what they are supposed to be. So when we look in 2 Timothy and we see that the word of God is good for uh, reproving, uh, it is that the word preached is good to convince men of the truth of Scripture and to actually show them their need for Christ. Uh, Paul, again, writing to the the, uh, <clears throat> the Colossian church in uh, chapter 1, verse 28 and 29, him we proclaim, Paul says, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. And he says, for this I toil, struggling with all energy that he powerfully works within me. Okay, so this is a combination of God working through the preacher with God's word to accomplish his purposes. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 through 12, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and his glory. 1 Thessalonians 5, 14, We urge you, brothers, again, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. And so there is a reproving that is done uh, with God's word in the church, as well as rebuke. Uh, And rebuke, a lot of times people think of rebuking in the sense of argumentation, uh, but it really deals more with the authority and the superiority of Scripture. It is when we look at Scripture, it is Scripture's authority by which we say something is right or or wrong. And in a world that is so topsy turvy on, you know, the truth is relative, uh, that things and people can be what you want them to be or what you feel like, uh, it is God's word that says, no, these things are true and these things are false. Uh, these things are good. These things are bad. So when we're speaking about rebuking, again, we're talking about the authority and the forcefulness by which we actually call something sinful. And we need to not back away from that. Uh, pastors, um, preachers, anyone who might be listening that way, do not be afraid to say, thus says the Lord, <laughs> uh, when you're preaching his word. Uh, and then on top of that, exhorting, uh, we need to also be diligent, not just to, you know, you know, throw out hellfire and brimstone sermons, uh, not just to do a bunch of rebuking uh, rebuking and reproving and all of those things. But we need to be diligent to speak words of comfort and encouragement uh, to the believer as well. 1 Timothy 4.13, Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, that is to building up, and to doctrine. Uh, you know, it is a beautiful thing when the word of God is preached rightly that the warnings from Scripture are given along with a building up from Scripture. When the when the believer's eyes are drawn toward Christ and what Christ has done on their behalf or, uh, you know, how Christ is, is for the believer. Uh, you know, you think about saints that are, you know, reaching the, the end of uh, their earthly journey here. Uh, these are times that... You don't just need to say to them, well, everything's going to be okay, or you're going to get along, or you're going to make it through this, but you can actually take God's word and 
give it to them and give them something more than just a a um an earthly lifting up i guess you could say <laughs> does that make sense yeah i think so i mean what you're trying to say is essentially i mean there has to be a much more depth to a sermon than just giving people the, the feel goods yeah exactly right and i mean obviously you don't want to be rebuking them the whole time and hitting them over the top of the head with a bible but right at the same time you have to be able to to get the ins and outs of all of scripture and um i guess what i'm trying to say is you have to give the full counsel of the word exactly exactly uh spurgeon said when you're listening to a man who professes to speak by God and for God and speak for your good and his heart yearns over you. Oh, it is a solemn work to preach and it should be a solemn work to hear also. Um, it's just a, it, it, the word of God is the primary tool of the pastor. Uh, Colossians 4, 3, Paul asks the church to pray and what he specifically asked them to pray for is that God may open to us a door for the word. Uh, he's not looking for partnerships uh, with authorities in the world. He's not looking for uh, specifically a, a large platform based on his personality or anything like that. Uh, his, his singular focus there is open the door for God's word to go in and to actually do its work. And he says, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains, he says. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's, you know, you were reading out of second Timothy, uh, second Timothy four Blake. And, and I, I jotted that verse down to thinking about this subject, but I, I was, I spent some time thinking about verse one there. And I can't remember if you read that or not. You might've started right after that or, or maybe yeah. you read it, but but the seriousness by which Paul gives this command to Timothy, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing in his king, by, sorry, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Like, think right. Of, think about right. it. Isn't that that's sobering? <laughs> I charge you in the presence right? of God and of Christ, who is to judge <laughs> like that. I don't know how, <laughs> if you're Paul, like how more serious you could be like, Right. This is important. Right. Pay attention. You are charged mm -hmm. by the by by the name of God Himself. Like that's big. That is big. Well, and it's it's not like he he doesn't carry weight as an apostle, anyways, right? So he's just he's invoking the name of Christ in the midst of it. Like, hey, I'm going to pull all the cards I got here. Preach the word, Timothy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, and yet, it, there's so many churches or places that proclaim to be churches uh, that would just look at that with a confused wonderment because preaching has so deteriorated uh, in their denomination or their particular church or whatever. And so, I mean, we are, I mean, all three of us, though we have different theological persuasions on, on different things, I mean, we would say that the key i mean one of the key supremacy points in the church and what we do and what happens on the lord's day is the preaching of the word yeah. of god yeah absolutely oh absolutely you know when i was first saved i was i it was in a small town in east texas like real time there was there might have been two churches there i think I, I don't remember exactly but the one that i ended up at because i was invited to was a uh, very, very charismatic church in a strip mall. And, um, it was, it was really bad, like really, really bad in <laughs> retrospect. I, at the time I didn't know any better and, and thanks <laughs> be to God. He, he brought me out of that and brought me into a churches that teach, that teach, preach the word and teach real doctrine. But the, the premise of this church, right? Like there was a pastor, but he preached quote unquote, like sometimes the majority of the church services mm -hmm. would be brother Bob has a word and brother Bob would stand up and just like in the middle of the congregation and just kind of ramble something. And it was a quote unquote inspired. And even at the time, like I was a, I was a baby Christian. Even at the time I was just like, I don't, why are we doing this? Don't we have a, a book that we can look at and know what God really said? You know, like 
So even at the time, it was like curious to me. Like I didn't, but I didn't question it. I didn't know enough to question it at the time. I was so right. so such a new Christian. But but it just makes the point. Like even even with this charge that Paul gives Timothy, he's aware people are going to turn away from this. They're going to start wandering and doing other things. Right. And it's you know logically, if you just read that, it's like okay, this is simple. Like the charge is relatively simple: preach the word of God, preach the counsel of God. In an expository way, mm-hmm. just preach the Bible. What does it say? Communicate yep. it to people. Yet, sin is so pervasive. My goodness, that we churches, so many churches now do everything but that, right? And it's right, it's incredible, right, I mean, right? Or they take, or they take the simple, or the t- simple command to preach the word is taken, and then things are. Um, <clears throat> it needs to be uh, you improved know, upon. It, things need to be <laughs> yeah. added. To, yeah. yeah, it needs to yeah. be improved yeah. upon. It needs to be added to. There needs to be some, you know, some sparkle and shine added to this old thing that, uh, you know, yeah, obviously is not as effective as Brother Bob's diary. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even if you think about it in like terms of pastoral burnout, I mean, how many guys that are pastors have such a broad focus on what their duties are because it's something other than being able, being able to be devoted to the ministry of the word, like the apostles yeah. talked about. Yeah, in prayer the and Book preaching, Acts, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you have you have two basic functions, and obviously, there's more things that fall under the domain of that. But when it comes down to doing all these different humanitarian works, and, yeah. I mean, and they're all good, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't feed the hungry or don't give bottles of water to people that need it. But when it becomes like the CEO or the brand builder or mm-hmm. you know, they're the vision caster or whatever the heck else that they want to say, the pity of it is they're not doing one of the main things that God has actually tasked them to do. Right. You know, I don't even know what casting vision is, and at this point, I'm scared to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to make a fisherman joke in there, but I don't. I don't have like a good joke to put out there. Right. So I'm just going to awkwardly state that. Maybe someone can leave that in the comments. <laughs> yeah, we section. need a good. We need a good yeah. joke. Yeah. We need somebody more witty. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so the preaching of God's word, number one, I think that was the first thing that came to our minds uh, as we were talking about this. Uh, the next thing that came to our minds was what? Sacraments. Uh, ordinances. Yeah, just for clarity, the difference between sacraments and ordinances, right? I think I would be, I think I'm correct in saying this. You can correct me if I'm wrong, Jack. Uh, that sacraments are viewed as a means of grace. Uh, for the believer, and we would say the ordinances are a picture and a reminder of something that God has already done. I would say that's mostly right, but I would say that that's, what you say is also true. Like, a sacrament would be a means of grace in a way that the Holy Spirit works to portray the visible promises of God, but in doing so, mm-hmm. he reminds us of it. Like, the best example I could give would be Passover, for for Israel, they would do that as a reminder of you know the God passing over the firstborn, right? That that whole thing. But they would have that meal as a visible reminder, which engaged the senses. Um, yeah. And and I would say that that's that's true today for um, for sacraments. And whether you call them sacraments or ordinances, there's theological reasons why we may do them differently between, say, a Presbyterian and a Baptist, but we don't argue about what they are. And I think that's important important to make, right? A point, that's an important point. An, an important point. I can't talk, right? So baptism yeah. and the Lord's Supper, right? And we agree on that, that. And fundamentally, we all would agree that we should do these things, correct? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's just what's happening when they're done is, is maybe yeah. where the distinctions. Yeah. Exactly. And how many how many uh, how many ordinances are there? Quiz time. Are you asking me? I don't. Either of you. Brayson's a Baptist. That's a Baptist question. That's like a an alley oop here. Yeah. I was hoping. I was hoping to. Tr- I was hoping to trick you into answering the question, Jay. So, for those who don't know, we have two Baptists here and one Presbyterian. So we're gonna we're gonna do some playful mocking back and forth, but it's all in good fun. Mostly. So when when Blake and I say that there's some popish remnants to Jack's theology, we don't entirely mean it. We don't entirely mean that he's part of the body of the Antichrist. Well, that's the chorus in the cast. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We... <laughs> 
comments blowing up. Oh, gosh. Right. Man, I yeah. will tell you, just quickly, that is maybe my biggest pet peeve of all, is when, to my Baptist brothers out there, when a Baptist looks at me and says that something like infant baptism is just leftover remnants from Rome or something yeah. like that. Yeah, well, if like, you don't like it, stop doing it, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty simple. Oh, that's a, I hadn't really thought about it like that. That's pretty good. I mean, that's a knockdown argument right there. That is. You don't, even need, you don't even need to look at the text. <laughs> so anyway, but not, not to get bogged down. We, we, will, we will and should do a podcast on, um, on like baptism and things. Because like, we don't have enough time to go into all that now. But I think that would be a lot of fun. Uh, but, but to the point, go back to what, what we're here for today. What does the church do? The church baptizes people. And the church gives the Lord's Supper, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think of a couple passages right off the top that, I mean, obviously we have within the Gospels, you have Luke and Luke 22, verses 19 through 20. And this is, I mean, obviously right before Christ's betrayal, he says that he took of the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, being his disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Now you have the same exact, I mean, pretty much verbatim repetition in Matthew 26, and then again in Mark 14. And then Paul picks that up in in 1 Corinthians 11. Um, But the the basic idea behind the Lord's Supper is that this is a, a means by which we are remembering the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord, and really what he accomplished in the gospel. And so when we're taking of the bread and eating of the bread, we're acknowledging Christ's body being broken on the cross on our behalf, and then we're acknowledging in in the same vein uh, the fact that his blood was really spilled for us. And so when we're doing the Lord's Supper, um, you know, obviously when we get into particulars between different denominations, we're going to have some different views. Like Jack, you said it's a, a means of grace. But what we're looking at, at the nuts and bolts of it on every level, is that we're all remembering Christ's Absolutely. sacrifice for us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree. So let me ask you guys, let me ask you guys this. What, what do you think about churches or, um, I say churches, that take liberty in how they do this? So instead of grape juice or wine, maybe it's... I don't know, Fanta, Sk- Skittles, Skittles, Skittles and Arizona yeah. tea. Yeah. <laughs> well, I so I knew so, I do know. Well, go ahead, Grayson. Yeah. I was going to say I I mean, I give some liberty in terms of fruit of the vine. I think that that's that's what the idea is in scripture is that it's not isolating particularly wine or grape juice or any of those things, but it is fruit of the vine and so that can be fermented or non-fermented. Um, while, while Grayson is finishing, real quick, Blake is rubbing his hands together. He's getting ready for something. So go ahead, Grayson. <laughs> yeah, he's going he's gonna to pounce on that one. <laughs> um, so I do think, though, that it, it, it does have to be a fruit of the vine, meaning it does have to be some form of like a wine. or, I mean, I'd, I'm a Baptist, so I'm obviously fine with grape juice in that as well. Um, I draw the line, though, there. And so I'm not going to look at it and say, yeah, you can do some coca-cola or whatever the heck else you want to do because there's a point um very very quickly i think where you just cross over to irreverence for what is being done Um, but also it's like if i if i'm going to do this act i want to be as close to scripture as possible so my my personal conviction is that i i believe wine was used and therefore i do wine i don't slam anybody for grape juice or anything like that i mean i think we we even had a guy years back who was deathly allergic to grapes and so what we did for him is we we ended up giving him some other form of juice that he could do but it was literally because he'd go into anaphylactic shock if he took even a little bit of grape juice so stuff like that i'm willing to give exceptions on but the exceptions never prove the rule or Mm -hmm. they're not the rule itself i should say they they do prove the rule um, same with the bread. It's like I'm not going to give you a free pass and say, go ahead and grab some Skittles or some you know, potato chips and you can do that because, again, we're looking at bread. And so what do we see in, in bread, especially if it's modeling the Passover, is unleavened bread. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, if somebody has a little bit, if they have leavened bread or something like that, am I going to throw a conniption fit? No. But 
I'm 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 gonna throw a conniption fit if you got Skittles, right? I mean, there's just something that's I think inherently wrong there. And when I see people do stuff like that, typically what it means is that they're they're doing it to be edgy, right? right. They're gonna be that right. kind of annoying guy who wants to say, well, I I can do this because I have freedom in Christ, and right. So I get annoyed with those people, right? And I think too is is. As Baptists, uh, that uh, people who try to make that argument of well, it doesn't it doesn't matter what the element is. We, I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't take that same approach with baptism. In fact, isn't that one of our big hangups? Is the mode of baptism is important? And I would say that if the mode of baptism is important, if we're talking the difference between you know submerging and sprinkling, and all of those different things, then that logic carries over that the elements within the um, <clears throat> uh, within the Lord's table uh, are important as well. So we don't have freedom just to pick whatever we want. We need to be as close to Scripture uh, as we can be on those things. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And. You know, I think back to it's not exactly the same, but um, the, the the concept is the same. There's this command in Scripture to do it, right? Like you, you go back to Second Timothy. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ, preach the word. Jesus commanded us, mm-hmm. you do this, right? And if we He commands us to do that, we should. You know, I think Grace, you said the word reverence, right? I mean, I, that's probably the best way to say it. There should be some reverence and some integrity in the way that we look at look at scripture and right what why 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 mess with it like you something know, like, what? right and i think it's kind of it's all kind of i'm having a clarity moment here is that so many of the problems that we run into on all the things that we're about to talk about preaching word baptism communion worship is things get messed up when somebody comes along and says how can i make this a more spicy how can I can I how can I add this a little how can I add a little flair to this, you know? Let's do a baptism with pizzazz. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> right. Like con, like confetti or something. The, no, like, the water yeah. slide baptism, you know, where you push them down you the get water some slide bath- and they go into yeah. the pool, you know. Stephen Furtick with his little squirt guns. Did he really couple. do that? I think he did. No, he didn't that, do it no. in a bapt he didn't do it in a baptism, but he he like called up a guy on stage and just squirted an, like a, a super soaker in his face during during for, during, COVID, the during COVID, there were pedo baptists using squirt guns. There were. I think those were. I think those were Roman Catholics. That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that was a zinger. All right, <laughs> one point for the Baptist. I'll give you that one. That's pretty good. <laughs> well, okay, speaking well, of oh, baptism. Go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, speaking of baptism, um, you know, obviously we disagree on things as far as that's concerned, right, Jack? You're a Pado Baptist, we're Credo Baptist. Do you, Blake? Do you pronounce it Credo or Credo? Credo. I okay. I do Credo, so I'm probably wrong. Okay, so we have three views. I usually, of baptism I, here, I, then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I'll give you a little insight. I learned how to pronounce most words by reading them. So, I mean, my pastor and my other friend who's a pastor up in Milwaukee, yeah. literally every time that I preached on one of the minor prophets, they're like, you're saying that wrong. I'm like, well, it's Amos today, and it's right. going to be Habakkuk. <laughs> and, I mean, I butchered him right yeah, and left. Yeah, right, so. right. Now I know it's Credo. So, there we go. Everybody will so dismiss me s- out of hand. So those two books of the Bible that you just stated that I'm not going to repeat, it's you were Amos? saying them incorrectly? I was. That's how I would have said it, Amos. So it's Amos and then Habakkuk. That that's the correct pronunciation. Yep. Okay, that's how a, I would have said cool. it, but I didn't want I mean, to say it out a, loud. And you didn't want to be potentially myself. wrong, but see how uh, that's right. You you could have been super smart here and been like, I know that it's Amos <laughs> and Habakkuk, and Grayson's an idiot. <laughs> I'm sitting here trying to think how you could say Habakkuk some some other way. Habakkuk. Were you saying like Habakkuk or something? <laughs> <laughs> now, if you could open up your Bibles to Kabuki, everybody's there. Goes to the reverence of the word again, right? Yeah, yeah. We just that we're off track. Okay, well, let's let's yeah. Let's All right, so back, back so, to baptism. Yeah, baptism. Yeah. All right, so. What I was going to basically say with baptism, again, we'll keep this one short because I know we're we're pressing on time. Um, but again, it's another command that's given, right? So we have 
right out of Matthew 28, 16 through 20. It's a great commission. Uh, Christ goes to the disciples and he tells them that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to him. Yep. And so he says, therefore, go. That's that's a command as far as not go, but actually go and make disciples. So make disciples is a command. And you have three participles in a passage. You have going, you have baptizing, and then you have teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And so it's one of the first commands that he actually gives the disciples. And we find this all throughout the narrative of Scripture, especially when we're looking at the early church just exploding. One of the very first things that these guys do is they go and be baptized, and they do so in obedience to Jesus Christ. So I know that obviously we would disagree on on modes of baptism and infant versus adult baptism, but at the heart of it, would you guys say it's fair to say what we share in common is that reality that when somebody comes to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, um, that when they are getting baptized, they're making a public profession of that faith and testifying that this is now something that they do in fact believe that Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection is their only hope in this life and in death. I know that's a very broad definition, um, and I'm doing that purposely just because I know we have disagreements on baptism. Um, but yeah, no, in terms I, 100%, of... 100%. 100%. Yeah, praise God. That's... Yeah, and 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 that that may be a misconception. People who believe and or uh, uphold infant baptism, we like I'm I I baptize my kids. I I have my kids baptized, I should say. But um, but I absolutely absolutely, if you were not baptized as an infant, you should absolutely, if you profess faith in Christ, uh, be baptized as an adult. Like recognize that new life. Absolutely, there's no disagreement here. The the where the where the distinction would come in, and again, not this is where we should would be good for another episode is once that new life and that 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 new relationship with christ is established what happens to that family after that it's kind of that next step that's the, that's where the difference would be yeah i do think that would be a good podcast for us to do um we should put it in the plans to make it happen yeah uh, i agree okay well let's go on so preaching and teaching ordinances slash sacraments and then the next thing that the church does uh, scripture reading and just real quick here I've I went and um, I let Google help me a little bit to be fair but uh, I gathered a few scriptures focused on when scripture references the hearing of the word right so this idea of scripture read the church reads read scripture so that, so people hear it uh, so I'm just going to run through these really quick Hebrews 2 1 therefore we must pay close pay, pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away from it Deuteronomy 6, 4, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's a whole section there after that that's great. Um, Deuteronomy 9, 1, hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today. Uh, give ear to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah, Isaiah 1, 10. Um, Jesus himself in Matthew 7, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock, and everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. And then the last one I got here, just in a, you know, kind of a quick list. Revelation 1.3, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it for the time is near. So That last one is, is a beautiful one in my mind. I mean, you, you literally have a promise that God is going to bless you if you read it and if you hear it. And so mm-hmm. that's one of those things where you get, I mean, the charismatic world where right they want to hear a word from god i'm like why don't you just read the bible and you can literally be blessed by god (laughs) that's incredible yeah yeah it's an incredible promise it really is and again it's simple like these what is the church supposed to do these these items we've kind of singled out here these marks that they're not complex in and of themselves they're simple things right it's just i think one really important facet and something to think about when you're Thinking about the reading of God's word, apart from the text that's being preached, so taking a, a portion of scripture and reading it, is that it is a sad fact that for some of the people sitting in the pews, you reading the scripture is the only scripture that they're getting. Because they're not reading it for themselves at home, in some instances. Uh, they're not getting into their word and things like that. And so you have to you have to understand that what's what's being read at the church you are <clears throat> you are giving them 
you are spoon feeding them God's word like you would Mm -hmm. a little baby who is not feeding itself. Uh, And then hopefully uh, it would be that they would then have an appetite, a God given appetite for the word and then would begin eating it, you know, themselves. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah, that would that'd be, obviously be the hope. Uh, the other, I mean, passage keep in mind, too, I don't know if you said this one, Jack, but First Timothy 4.13. Um, Paul, again, is talking to Timothy, and he says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation, mm-hmm. and to teaching. And so then, I mean, again, you just you go right back to the ministry of the Word. Right. In which I would say, even Scripture reading, just the plain reading of Scripture, um, it is a ministry of the word that mm-hmm. God has given us to be able to perform for the, I, I, I mean, I hate to use the word perform because it sounds, it has that connotation of like stage acting and that's not what I mean. Um, I, I guess what I mean by perform is simply, it is something we are to do. It's a plain command, but it is, you know, an exhortation to, yeah, it's something, like, that, we're, something that we're commanded to, to carry out. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I actually didn't jot this one down, but but you guys made me think of it, uh, and I'm surprised it didn't, just didn't come to my mind. But Romans ten seventeen, so then faith comes by hearing, and by hearing by the word of God. Like, why, why read? But like that goes right to I think right in line with what you were saying. Like this, mm-hmm. this may be when people because they're not doing it at home, right? They're not doing it on their own. So right. if given the opportunity, we read them scripture because God moves. God right. moves through His word. Right. Yeah. And an example of yep. that in Scripture is what Paul says to Timothy, that he was brought up under knowing the Scriptures from his mother and his grandmother, hmm. you know? Yeah, great example. Yeah, really good. Okay, Any, anything else on Scripture reading? I think that's pretty pretty straightforward. It's so important. but yeah. Just yeah. just do it. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, just, just do it. Just do it. <laughs> um, okay, and then uh, prayer. What does the church do? The church prays. You know, that this one is so significant, um, so, so significant in terms of a distinction and a mark in the church. Not, not that it's not to raise it above any of the others or not. I'm just but it is such a such a distinct thing that the people of God do as they pray. Right. Mm-hmm. And they pray faithfully. I am um, one of my favorite quotes by Spurgeon is I know of no better thermometer of, of to your spiritual temperature than this. The measure of the intensity of your prayer. Mm-hmm. That right. one, that mm-hmm. one stings a little bit, doesn't it? It, it absolutely does. Yeah. In, in it all does. The good ways, right? I think uh, you had Martin Luther too, who I, I can't remember exact time frame, but he was just like, I, uh, I'm so busy that I spend my first two hours of the day <laughs> yeah. in prayer. <laughs> right, right. You know, I love that <laughs> quote. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Something. That, yeah, oh, it was man. something to the effect of, yeah, I have so much to do today that I could not possibly get any of it done unless I spend the first three hours in prayer, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Each time you tell it, it amps up another hour. So the next time, yeah, it right. Gets repeated, Four hours. Yeah, like, right. Unless I spend five you guys know hours. Martin Luther in spent prayer. ten hours in prayer every day. <laughs> yeah. Who was the? Who was the? You guys are reminding me now. The I'm blanking on the guy's name. He's a missionary to India. Famous missionary in India, Baptist. Oh, is that that's not Deep, Adoniram Deepak Judson? Chopra? I think it was Judson. Yeah, I think it was Judson. There's a story I remember hearing about him, and and as and I'm I could be totally butchering this. So if someone someone's like none of this is true in the comments, <laughs> like <laughs> Jackson, we're making up stories, man. <laughs> none of it's that. It's one of those stories that sounds great. <laughs> But you made me think of it I, as I remember it being told, or as I remember reading it some time ago. He um, it took a long time for him to get converts, right? Like years and years and years, and he went through all kinds of turmoil. But he was just faithful in preaching and ministering and witnessing Christ to the to these people. And he would there's some quote or something along the lines of he would he would go to this certain tree, and he would pray, and he would not get up until he felt like God. God met him there. And there were times he would spend six hours a day praying. That was like, wasn't, wasn't uncommon. Right. Hmm. And, and again, I, I may be butchering some of the details, but I think that's generally true. Um, but just the commitment to prayer. Mm-hmm. And if you follow his story, it ended up working out. I mean, the, the Lord began converting people in droves right. after right. six, seven years. It took some time, but right. yeah. Um, but that, but that's the mentality. Right. And I, 
man, I just say this. I don't do that. Like, I do not mm. pray with that with that fervor that, like I should. I th- what, what keeps a, what we'll, keeps a church um, from praying? What keeps a church from praying? Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I say that jokingly. I mean, you can you but can get media, into all sorts right? of Digital different media, things with right? that. Like but... that's a big that's a big distraction these days. Not the only one, well, right? Maybe not the first one, but the, it's a big distraction. I'd say the biggest one is sin. Um, legitimately, I would just say it's sin. We're, we're far too easily captivated with what Hebrews would talk about as a sin that entangles us, but also, like you mentioned, Jack, all those other things that aren't necessarily sinful. But they entangle us nonetheless because we're yeah. not quite running the race with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I wonder how many people actually shut off the podcast yeah. when I said that. <laughs> I was, yeah, yeah. I'm getting ready to turn it off right now. Actually, <laughs> no. I mean, I would say. I mean, one of the things that I that, that my mind is constantly drawn to is that prayerlessness is a major symptom, not just of distraction, but of pride. That you don't believe fundamentally that you need to pray, uh, that you can get through your day, that you can accomplish your tasks, that you can witness, that you can preach God's word, that you can live the Christian life, and you can do so without God's help uh, is the thought that goes behind prayerlessness. And I think the point is proven there when things get really, really bad in your life or a tragedy hits, what's your instinct as a Christian? You to pray. instantly yeah. pray more. Like y- yeah. your your prayer life, uh, you know, heightens and amplifies because it's this bucket of cold water that says, "Man, I'm not as uh, I'm not as independent as I thought I was, uh, or as yeah. I have you know fooled myself into believing." Yeah. Uh, and so I think it's guys like you know your, your missionary to to India that. You're going along, and you realize there's there's nothing I can do to force these people to convert. So either God's going to build the house, or it is going to all fall to pieces. Uh, so that was the same testimony with Hudson Taylor. It was the same same yeah. thing. Is no no tactic, no anything was working, um, and it was just the sheer mercy of God that I believe through prayer uh, that that made that ministry begin to blossom. Well, I think William Carey had the same thing. Um, If I remember, his sister, we don't even know her name at this point because history just doesn't record it, but he had an invalid sister who prayed the whole time that um, he was, because he was, where was he at? South Chicago. you guys remember? (laughs) South Chicago. (laughs) He's by that big shiny bean in the middle of the park. (laughs) Sorry, this is a terrible joke. He was in. Was, <laughs> hang on, maybe that's something. Was William Carey in India? I don't know. Man. Regardless, the we the sister not good with ended up. Our she, Sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Grayson. She she was an invalid, and so she was literally stuck in day all all day praying for him. But right, he would update right. with regular correspondence and. So she was just dutifully in prayer all the time. Yeah, um, right. So you know a name like William Carey, but you'll never know his sister's name. And yeah. here she is, the one who's behind the scenes praying for it all. And I think without her prayers, God, I, uh, this sounds terrible to say because it's, I mean, you, you, people's theology is going to kick in right now. But the the sheer fact of the matter is that without her praying, mm-hmm. I, I honestly believe that wouldn't have been accomplished Right, we can get in our our Calvinistic mindset and say, "Well, God is sovereign," and it's very true. And, but God sovereignly orchestrates the very prayers yeah. in the minds of His saints that He's pleased to work through. Right. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what does the church do? The church prays. Church prays, and then the last thing uh, I've got here, as we're coming in, um, just a few minutes left here, is praise. I think like worship praise. Yeah. Um, and I think that's pretty straightforward, uh, especially in our modern modern day and age. Uh, if anything, we as a as a evangelicals emphasize this one too much, right? We we're big on worship. We mm. we build churches around worship. And um, when we were chatting about this la- or earlier, we I brought up the point that if you think about the way churches are designed, it says a lot. It can say a lot, right? About what they what they uphold, right? In the Reformation, 
as opposed to Roman Catholicism, they'll, they would keep the the Eucharist and these things right in the center, and the the pulpit was off to the side. When the Reformation happened, rightly so, you know, the Word of God is central, so the pulpit was moved to the center. It was the focus. It was the central, right? Mm-hmm. And now, if you think about so many churches today, um, what's central? It's a stage. Mm-hmm. Like the the building yep. is is built around a place to put musicians. And I think you know uh, it's not evil in and of itself, but I think it's just a visual reminder of where we've come. There's just that that's it's it's these we, we want to get emotional charges out of people, and music is the easiest way to do it. Mm-hmm. And we'll draw them in that way as opposed to faithfully preaching the word of God or faithfully praying, right? Like you know, like these missionary uh, friends, like just such a different mindset, right? Right. I think it was Bill Johnson, right? I mean heretic notorious from Bethel Redding, California, who said something to the effect of like what well, we can't sneak in the back door of the church through our preaching, we can get in there through our music. Yeah, right. 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 And I'm like it's like that's a pretty damning statement, but the guy knows the power of music and one sense of being able to to get beyond a boundary that um people won't hear through preaching or teaching or some other method. But for us on our end, it, it, I think it speaks to the, the reality of, like, if the word is central, then the theology and the music should also be reflected. Right, that. right. Yeah, so what we're finding in the word needs to inform what we are singing. And I think when we think of worship, particularly in a church service, we're thinking of worship in the uh, form of the congregation singing. Now, we can get into methodology and things like that, and maybe that would be a good podcast on its own because I think there's I think the American Christian church culture has gone very awry uh, in in many mm-hmm. places when it's come to when to worship and singing uh, but when it comes to those things singing is commanded in scripture it's not an it's not an optional thing for the super spiritual it's not a suggestion uh, the Bible commands us to sing. Uh, to the Lord, Ephesians five eighteen through twenty one, do not get drunk with wine, that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I mean that right there again. Fundamentally, we did, we have a command that we are to sing praises and make melody to the Lord. Now, uh, of course, we can get into psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and all of that, but fundamentally, even if you disagree, if it means three different things or if it means psalms, psalms, and psalms, uh, fundamentally, we are called uh, and commanded to sing. Furthermore, uh, I think we mentioned this before when we were talking uh, a while back, but we have a God who sings Matthew twenty six thirty, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. After taking the Lord's Supper, Jesus and the disciples they sang a song of praise. Uh, before Jesus was given up to be crucified, he sang with his disciples. I think that is uh, really significant. Uh, Zeph- yeah, Zephaniah three seventeen also says, uh, "The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness." It's this picture of, you know, of even the Lord singing, um, and then singing. I mean, we were talking about the, you know the, the methodology thing, and the, Grace was mentioning the Bill Johnson stuff and all of that. Music fundamentally is powerful. Uh, it mm-hmm. engages our memory. Uh, songs uh, that we sing shape us and form us uh, primarily probably because we remember them because they're so much easier to remember they stick with us in our minds Uh, through joyful times and through dark times uh, it's songs often that provide for us an anchor of hope i mean how many martyrs in church history are you know go to their death singing you know, yeah. singing yep. hymns, singing uh, the word of God. Uh, you know, you think about the 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 things that even um, 
man, I, I just I like a thing like songs like Amazing Grace um, and Can It Be. I mean, these are like theologically, re- you know, bangers like Read Your Bible, Pray Every Day, you know, <laughs> that kind of, <laughs> my daughter likes Love's that. Life. Yeah, my daughter loves that song right now. So we sing a lot of Read yeah. Your Bible, Pray Every Day. I really and like that song, Let, Let the River Flow. Do you guys know that one? Let the Healing River Flow. <laughs> Do you remember I that don't. one? Let, Let the River Flow. It's terrible. I'm totally kidding. No, I don't. <laughs> it was like, um, it was a really bad worship song from like 2004. Yeah. So there's like four people out there who's going to get that joke. Right. So basically, the song is it just the guy just says, Let the River Flow like over and over for five minutes. <laughs> So, I think those are literally the lyrics. Right. Yeah. So Jack, you what do you have, like, so Jack, what do you have against the river flowing? Is what we need to know. <laughs> no, I want the, I want it to flow. Let it flow. <laughs> right. Let right. it flow. <laughs> Can you just imagine that's uh, that's Saul or uh, Paul and Silas and in, in, or is it not? It's not Paul and Silas. It's Peter and Silas, right? In prison when they're singing hymns. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're just singing "Let the River Flow" over and over again until the <laughs> angel comes and releases them. <laughs> yeah, he's like, "Enough! It's driving me crazy." Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. No, but singing I, like so singing like it has had a huge effect on our memory. I mean, how many times can we remember songs that we heard like years and years and years ago, and they just kind of yeah. you know come back to us? Singing also is powerful because of course it engages our emotions, hmm. and so as we're singing, it involves. The is we're singing and as we're worshiping, it does involve the whole person, uh, and it's more than just worship. Is more than just agreeing with theology. Uh, yep. Our theology informs our emotions, and one of the best outlets, of course, then for our emotions and for our praise is singing. And I would say that the Christian should be compelled to sing in view of God's greatness and in view of what he has done. Yep. Um, I mean, there shouldn't be uh, a fear of, a, of an emotional uh, connection with, with what is going on in, in your praise and in your singing. Of course, I think, I think all of us would agree uh, that when we are worshiping, there needs to be a, a hymnody. This isn't a concert. Uh, this is God's people collectively singing together praises to God. Yeah, one of the things I really enjoy about um, the the person who does our our songs at the church is she's literally always thinking about what's best for the congregation. Right. And so in every aspect, it's never going to be, it's never a show, right? It's not going to be, hey, let's prop up this person who's a great singer and let's get a super talented band. That's and it, right. that's not me saying the band's not talented because they are incredibly so, but it's always it will never be to the detriment of the congregation because right. the whole goal is to get them to sing praises to their king. Right. And, and, so, as the, and as the body of Christ, look at how many things that we do in, at church that are meant to unify the congregation. Yep. I mean, when we're taking the Lord's Supper, it is a unifying moment, though it is also an individual moment. When we're singing and worshiping, it is an individual moment, but it is also a unifying moment moment it's not it's not meant for you know the the guy on stage to go off into a power solo and do his thing and and whatever uh the singing in church is meant to be honoring to the lord and unifying for the congregation yep uh yeah Yeah, i mean there's a there's a there should be a singleness of mind uh in in the moment i would say yeah, I'll put it this way. I'd rather have somebody that's not a good singer leading worship than to have somebody who's just up there to showboat. Like, you can get 50 people to sing with that one person, even if they just get up with a pitch pipe and lead a hymn. But the person who's showboating, you'll never get that whole congregation to sing together and but, actually be unified in that truth. But do you know what you will get? A spontaneous word from Brother Bob. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> You know, I just really so, felt the spirit moving there. So funny, funny anecdote there. So the church was so small, and in like nowhere, nowhere East Texas, there were no musicians. So the only way that we could do music was to like play a CD. That's what I'm talking yep. about. Yeah, that was it. Let's see, you have a, a full track of Carmen on, right? There was a lot of Carmen, a lot of letting the river flow. <laughs> you know, because I got saved because I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I got. 
saved later on in life. Uh, so I was never introduced to Carmen, and it wasn't until I married my wife that Blake. I even that I even found out who Carmen was. Blake, I want you to as soon as this podcast is over, stop everything you're doing. And go watch some Carmen music videos. No, no, I have, I have. That's what I'm saying. I was <laughs> okay, like, what? Okay. I was like, what is this? And then I got into this this Carmen rabbit hole of there's no monsters in my house. You know? Yeah. I have no yeah. idea who Carmen is. I've just seen Jack make a couple of memes about him, and I'm like, because I, I mean, the same thing for me. I didn't come to faith until 21, so I've got none of the none of this. <laughs> All right, let's salvage this. So, what does the church do? I think we we summed it up, right? Um, Preaching and teaching, ordinances slash sacraments, scripture reading, prayer, and then praise. And Blake, your your comments on um, on the importance of it being a communal thing are spot on, right? And it's so yeah. important today. Yeah. The church is not meant to be a rock concert. Like the entertainment aspect should not come from watching a musician or hearing someone sing or play a guitar, right? The entertainment should be. Right should be from worshiping the Lord himself. That's that's where the joy should come from. Right. Just swelling up from in us, from worshiping the God of the universe. Also, listener, I'm just telling you this because I love you. It's not entertaining. It's annoying. We don't want to hear your concert. Your musicians aren't that good anyway. Jack can cut this out later. <laughs> that's a hot take right there. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, any anything else to uh, we should we should touch on? Now all the musicians. Now all the musicians. Well, they're not are listening because yeah, so. I told them podcasts were were destroyed. They're oh, right. all, all the musicians life. are like that yeah. wasn't exactly a chorus in the chaos. That was more chaos in the chorus. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. the The very name of the blog slash podcast is kind of in that that mindset, right? Like this idea of of a community singing together. Like that's kind of implied in the name, but. Anyway, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. great stuff. Um, yeah, any 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 closing words? Or are we are we good? I think I'm good. All right, ditto. Well, thanks for thanks for listening, and until next time. <laughs>